Hi, and welcome to another live Q&A. Uh, this week, we've got Chris Rabbit, for, uh, founder of Meow with us. How are you, Chris? I'm good, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on, Johnny. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're now live streaming on Facebook uh, in the Facebook group, the Yorkshire Business Club. Uh, we're also uh, live streaming on LinkedIn, uh, if you're watching there, hello, and on YouTube as well. And what I've not told Chris is that this is the first uh, episode that's going to be uh, on our on the new podcast. Uh, so uh, you'll hear lots more about that. But we could have some podcast listeners as well. So if you're listening, uh, it's great to have you here as well. Uh, if you've got any comments or you want to ask Chris anything, please do uh, use the comments below or ask questions throughout. I'll try and bring them in uh, if you've got any questions to ask. Um, but it's great to have you here. Um, Chris, it would be good just to... Uh, what's really weird is we've sort of we're, we're the same age although obviously I look a lot younger uh, well, <laughs> <obviously>. <laughs> um, we, we've we've followed quite a journey we're, we're, we're both from Liverpool we went to schools that were opposite op, on the same road opposite each other uh, we're then three roads away from each other now in Leeds uh, it's it's it's, 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 it. following me. it's, it's, it's quite it's, scary to be fair Johnny <laughs> and, and to be fair, you moved over to Yorkshire before I did as well. So it's it, it's crazy. And and we were just talking about you. You were a rugby player, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. Played for uh, for a long time. Uh, really uh, in the process. Uh, but the interesting part was, you know, who you who you played against. Uh, I mean, you might have some other stories, but from my point of view, um, you know, I was in the same year as Ben Kay, who uh, is a World Cup winner. You you played against merchants. Uh, played against yeah. Ben K, um, and uh, and and it's uh, it's just fascinating. Well, what a lot of people don't know is uh, Ben K, who obviously a World Cup winning lock or second row, depending on uh, on how old you are. Um, actually, started his rugby career as a winger, and uh, he was always a really tall lad, but he used to be like bits of knotted string. And uh, Merchant Taylor's tactics back in the day, and to be fair. We got hammered every time we came to. <laughs> we did not have a particularly good team at St Mary's at the time, um, but the tactic was to throw the ball to Ben, and he would charge up the wing and knock our wingers out of the way and uh, and score some tries. And he was good at it. And there was always some talent there. But one thing Ben didn't like was being tackled. Ben used to get a little bit tearful when he got tackled, and I because I was always a number eight. And I remember coming off the back of some scrums and working the angle and mincing Ben Kane to touch on a couple of occasions, as much as you do mince people when you're 12 years old. But I remember taking him into touch quite hard on a couple of occasions and, and standing up again and, you know, off of the hand and a few little tears coming. He didn't like it at all. You, you probably just hyper competitive rather than getting a bit emotional, but uh, it was fun nonetheless and good to look back on. So it, It's great to look back I'm on. I used to play with uh, Paul Dalgleish as well, Kenny's son. Yeah, yeah. In your year as well, wasn't it? Well, well, I was I was used to Kenny coming to our sports day. You see, that's just too much for any. Are you a Liverpool fan as well? Yeah, <laughs> too much. I, I just get all. I just get overwhelmed if Kenny <laughs> turned up. So <laughs> it was it, no, it was it was great. It was really good. Um, so um, I, we are going to get on to uh, we. I, I'm going to talk. Uh, uh, about meow i mean f unbelievable what you've uh, uh what's what's been created over lockdown um i, I want to talk about that and you're uh, i think in the middle of a launch of a, a crowd fundraiser on there um you've got um a very strong sales background want to get into that as well um and uh, i want to understand sort of the the journey you know how things happened you you you, you were telling me earlier that you uh, very early on we're selling uh, beer to working men's social clubs is that is is that where the sales started then or was it prior god to no no god sales for me started back when i was uh, 7 years old i think um and my father used to have a, a footwear business where we'd import and retail and we used to work the 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 markets in and around liverpool and north wales and I started my sales career selling flip flops at fifty pence a pair at the front of my dad's market store, and that's where I, you know, it, it all started for me. I suppose I don't think I ever grew up wanting to be a salesman, 
but it was always something I was really good at. So, uh, yeah, started back then. But, yeah, I did. I, I sold beer to working men's clubs. And if you've ever watched Phoenix Nights, I can tell you right now that that is not a fictional television series. It is a documentary. <laughs> you think you see some weird stuff in that program? I guarantee I've seen weirder. It's a great program. I, I absolutely love Peter Kay. And uh, uh, what's the uh, uh, his name's escaped me? It was in my head a second ago. Uh, but it's a, it's a yeah, Paddy it's, McGuinness. Paddy McGuinness, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great program. Uh, <laughs> um, and so, so the so you were selling to how did and and then talk to me about how things then progressed. Um, what what was the what was the sort of start of your career? What were you doing? Uh, from university, I was, uh, please don't throw tomatoes either literally at the screen or in the chat. Uh, I started out as a recruitment consultant. I left university uh, really not knowing what I wanted to do, because I'll be honest, from being a child, quite a small child, I was always fascinated with aeroplanes and aviation and all that. I wanted to be a fast jet pilot. It's as simple as that. Um, but I got too big before my eyes went. And I still have bad eyesight, but not good enough to go and be a pilot. Uh, but I was too big even before that happened anyway. And they do it by the length of your thigh. So, Because if your thighs are too long, when you eject from a plane, you'll rip your legs off at the knee, which is not an outcome anyone wants, really. You want to eject whole and you know happy, and so you can actually walk when you land. But uh, that, that ruined it for me. And so I had no idea I spent... The last four years at school, not knowing what I wanted to do. So I went and did an English degree at university and then started uh, as a as a recruitment consultant at Hayes. And, you know, in the most hated profession, in the most hated firm in the whole of recruitment. So, you know, it, you develop a skin like a bull rhino at the time. So, I'm guessing that that was uh, in the boom years, though, thinking of our oh, age. Yeah. yeah. It was great. Don't get me wrong. It was just tailing off in terms of the industry had started to cannibalize itself fairly aggressively. There was a massive pressure on price. But we started, you know, sort of in the tail end of the golden era where you could charge properly for the service that you provided. And, and we all made a reasonable amount of money. It was uh, it was fun. And I'll be honest with you, the the, the training at Hayes was absolutely outstanding. Um, you know, it was properly structured and invested in. They spent time doing it. It was great. You know, it was a, one of the best sort of setups that I've ever seen in terms of creating really, really good and tenacious salespeople. It was it was spot on. And there's loads and loads of lessons I learned there that uh, that I've taken all the way through my career. And so and I pass those on now. Well, I'm wondering if one of those would have been sales. So I'm 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 fairly certain that part of being a recruitment consultant is is a sales part of the role or you, you disagree no, oh no, you, no. you agree yeah it's not a part of the role it, it is the role because what with recruitment it's it is one of the hardest jobs in the whole world and i completely get why people don't like recruiters and it's not because of the recruiters it's because of the way that they are made to behave by the industry that they're in and that's a whole podcast on its own, and I won't get into it now. But the whole job is sales. So first of all, you have to go find a job to work on. So that means selling your services and yourself to your customer. Then you come back in, and then you have to go sell that job to a candidate or a number of candidates. Then you have to sell those candidates back to the company. Then you have to sell the company and the job back to the candidate. And then you have to broker that whole agreement all the way along accounting for the vicissitudes of people's you know personality until you get to the point where they'll sign a contract and actually start work and only then if you work in contingent can you bill and so what i always tell people now and i mentor a couple of recruiters and i tell them if they're talking about price with customers the best way to explain it is as long as you only work with me on a contingent basis you don't pay for the successful jobs. You pay for the ones that aren't. It's as simple as that. Um, but it's it's a great industry. Unfortunately, it, it cannibalized itself far too aggressively and ended up being, you know, in a, in a headlong race to the bottom. 
And I think there's a few sort of exceptions to that. But, you know, unfortunately, it's not the industry it was, which is why I chose to get out as long ago as I did. Um, uh, but that must have given you that uh, the drive to stay in sales or to be in sales uh, because that's where you are now. What what was what what came after recruitment? Was it straight into a sales role or I did, went and worked for Bass and sold beer for a little while. Oh, so there was the beer straight after the recruitment. Well, that's a say. Yeah, you were selling you were selling beer. It's a sales role. No, it's 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 a, it's every young man's dream job. I go in and sell it beer, but uh, yeah, as I say, in that environment, it was just hilarious. It was more hilarious than it was anything else. I remember being in, and this is maybe uh, a bit uh, a bit strong for a, a lunchtime program, but it's <laughs> the story I came out of my time at Bass is I was in uh, in the the East Midlands um, at a miners' welfare club um, and was doing a late night um, judging a, a giant vegetable competition. <laughs> and having a couple of beers afterwards and was had arranged to stay in the 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 steward's house at the back of the thing so I you know and I remember going back sitting down having a glass of wine with uh, the steward and his wife and then being invited to participate in a threesome <laughs> I respectfully and quickly declined wow it just got it was just weird it was weird 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 that's the weirdest of all of them but it was just weird all the way through <laughs> what, what 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 was the uh the main role after that then after the uh the bass role i went to bass then back into recruitment because people kept asking me um and to be fair, I was in and out of recruitment like a fiddler's elbow because I could make money doing it. It was relatively that wasn't easy. That's the wrong word, but it was it was comfy. Yeah, um, you were good. You were good at it. Good at it. Um, and then just stopped doing that. Um, pretty much when I came back to Leeds, really did a little bit of it. Used to run Randstad's business in Leeds, which was great fun. And actually, out of a lot of recruitment businesses, I have an enormous amount of respect for Randstad. They are doing it in a slightly different way, uh, which is good, and much more focused on quality and experience and, and all the rest of it than necessarily ball out, balls out sales. But that was an interesting time. And then, to be honest with you, I went self-employed after that. I didn't really know what I wanted to do anymore. I just knew I didn't want to do recruitment anymore. So, you know, as is my way, I suppose, I finished off on a Friday doing a budget report for my director and then on the monday i did afternoon tea for a hundred people as i started my new catering business <laughs> um, and yeah didn't look back did that for four years and did um and again talking about weird environments i ran a catering business that operated golf club catering franchises and yeah hilarious golfers are the weirdest people in the world and i love half of them and I hate the other half and I think they all know exactly which camp they're in um, but it was great fun it was loads of fun I got an opportunity to do what I love to do as a living because I was always I'm always a I've always been an enthusiastic home cook and uh, did that for I'd say for three or four years um, for a living and it was great you know made a good living out of it enjoyed myself it was busy and hard and you know, very involving, but it was it was great fun. And there's another whole raft of stories from that experience that uh, that I could bore you all with, but I won't. Um, and then I thought, well, okay, I've run a catering business for four years. I decided to close that because it wasn't ever going to be what I wanted it to be. I set it up to be, you know, in the way that I do, set it up to be this multi-franchise uh, operation with maybe five or six golf clubs or seven golf clubs in it. Um, and actually, it worked out that you can only really do one. I had three to go at once, and uh, it, it was impossible. Your return on your, your risk and the money that you put in is not enough if you're not there yourself. Um, so I closed that and thought, well, okay, I've been a chef for four years. I'll, uh, I'll go and learn to be a chef. So I went and worked in a two-rosette restaurant, um, the Crown at Rowcliffe, for a year. Um and I had a great time doing that and actually learned how to be a chef there. I could cook before, but I learned how to be a chef there. It was a really, really interesting year. 
So, do you, so do you, have you, has that carried on and do you do much cooking at home now? I do most of the cooking at home, um, although my wife is a really good cook as well, which is probably why I can't lose weight. Um, but no, we, we, it's, it's one thing that's really, it's really important to me, I'll be honest with you, and, and I am quite um, evangelical and quite forthright about my opinions about food. Um, I think we all take it far too for granted take for granted the act of preparing food and i think um we also take for granted the importance of sharing food and actually it being an experience for people um i am never happier when i've got people sat around my table and i'm feeding them tasty stuff because that, that's just my happy place um simon my business partner we have a working breakfast every saturday and that means him coming to me because, frankly, I want to enjoy my breakfast. And so Simon turns up willing <laughs> every Saturday and gets fed to the, you know, gets fed to the gunnels, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, a bacon sandwich or a, a handmade, a homemade cinnamon roll or whatever else. And no, I'm not telling you where I live. <laughs> what's the, what's, well, I'm interested, you know, when you've got a, a dinner party or people around the table and you're feeding them, what's the, what is the thing that, that, what's the pleasure? What's the, the thing that you really enjoy? What's, what, what is it about it that you like, uh, that, that people like what you're giving them? I, well, I don't know. I know that, well, I, I like that people enjoy it. Um, there's a bit of me that's a tart. And likes to hear people go, "Ooh, that's lovely!" It, it, aren't you clever? You know, because let's be honest, most people are shit cooks. There you go. I've said it. Most people can keep themselves alive, but most people are not particularly good cooks. And it's nice when you can when you can introduce people if they've not done it before. The, the stuff that you can do, you know, it's like, yeah, come try this, try this, try that. And I like messing about with you know, experimenting with stuff and feeding people stuff they've not had before. But at the same time, there's just as much pleasure in sitting down for a bowl of stew and a bit of mashed potato. I, I, I just think I just think it fits well into uh, some of the conversation uh, we've had previously. Um, but all but but what excites you in in some of the roles that you do is being able to help a business uh, sell um, and yeah. being able to being able to to help teams uh find better ways of working together to be able to sell their products or services and i'm wondering um if there's uh if there's some sort of mirroring there on on uh, on just how you were describing food it, it certainly popped into my mind um and, and and but let's be clear that is that is what you enjoy doing um from a, a business point of view you're you know you're actively seeking companies that uh, we'll we'll get onto meow in a moment but yeah. your other hat um, is actively seeking companies that uh, that are uh, uh, that are looking to to sell more. What what are the what describe the, the typical clients or the typical problems or what what are the typical things that you fix? I'll be honest with you, there is, there is no such thing because it's like saying, you know, businesses are not cut from a cookie cutter mold. It's not a situation of okay, I have a business of twelve people, therefore my problems will be the same as every other business of twelve people. And I think that's why, at a, at a certain level, that's why training, sales training, is ineffective sometimes. And uh, don't get me wrong, I use sales trainers, and I have an enormous amount of respect for some sales trainers, and I will refer them and put them into businesses whenever and wherever I can because they, they do good work. But training is a, is a fixed, static syllabus curriculum whatever you want that applies very generally across the whole range of problems and what i do is go in and have a look at your business and work out where your problems are you might not even know that yourself most people have an idea they understand basically what's not working for them and half of them understand a little bit about why but most of them don't know how to to get over that and so my job is to make sure that if you have salespeople, they perform as well as they can, that they're all pointed in the same direction, that they're all singing the same song, that they're working to their own strengths. 
And that's really important is that one size doesn't fit all for salespeople. People think that it does. And so it's very personal the way that you manage them and very individual. It doesn't take a huge amount of chopping and changing. You just need to be able to adapt your approach to each individual person. Some respond well to a kick in the ass. Some respond well to an arm around the shoulder. Some respond more, more to bonus. Others respond well to different things, you know. Um, and at the same time, I'll be honest, most entrepreneurs aren't salespeople, classically. Everyone has to be. But people, salespeople are crap at starting businesses because most of them are quite disorganized. And most entrepreneurs are not salespeople. So they don't, they don't understand it in their soul. And I think you've got to. If you want to make a sales team really perform, you have to really understand it. And so what I try and do is drive a bit of visibility in between the boardroom and the sales team. And my absolute sweet spot is if you've got a sales team of about five or more being managed by a managing director, guarantee that, that individual is either having trouble managing his business, or her business, or trouble managing his or her sales team, because you can do one or the other effectively, and you can't really do both. And I'm sure we'll get a howl of complaint from MDs that do, and that's fair enough. If you can, that's fine. But generalisms exist because they're generally true. So, uh, and, and that's that's my belief. So. It's just making sure because the best the best way to to sort of evidence that is I remember talking to a guy at a networking event who said, I don't need you. I've got a four million pound pipeline. And he told me a little bit about his business. And I basically said to him, No, you don't. He's like, I do, I do. I know what I've got, and I've got a four million pound pipeline. So to cut a long story short, I won't tell you the whole bit, but basically it involved a bit of a bet based on my involvement with his company. And I went in and I did an honest appraisal of his pipeline, worked with his sales team, spent two days in the business, and worked out that his pipeline was worth about 125,000 quid. Wow. And, and he actually, he, he had a little weep with me. And he said, well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm buggered. And I'm like, well, no, you're not, because your turnover is the same. What we've identified is exactly where your growth is coming from. And then he started having a, oh, yeah, well, the bloody salespeople, I'm going to sack them all, and they're telling me lies and blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, 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 they're not. They're telling you exactly what you want. Because he was after, um, you know, unicorns, you know, elves, fairies, any hint of anything that was just a, a whiff of a sale. He wanted it in the pipeline. So he, he asked for that, and that's exactly what he got. Because let's be honest, salespeople are the biggest optimists in the world. Hey, I've got a deal. It's amazing. You know, whoa, yeah, brilliant. We'll stick everything in the pipeline. And so he, he was getting what he was asking for. He was dead happy. The business wasn't failing. No bother. But what he didn't have was any visibility about what was going on, and that's what we put in there for him. And if I can do nothing else, that will help a business more than anything else. It's it's fascinating to hear how you describe it, uh, and um, uh, you know I can I can see this in so many organisations that I even work with. Uh, it, you're, you're painting a, a a picture that's just you know simple to see. Um, fast forwarding massively, um, you what happened in uh, when coronavirus chaos came along, and we were all. <laughs> Uh, sent home and, and businesses closed. Um, what happened for you to suddenly, during lockdown, come out with this amazing idea of Meow? Um, you're about to launch a, a crowdfund. Um, talk about this pivot and this story uh, about what's happened recently. It's quite an interesting story, and the story itself sort of proves the concept of Meow. So it's lovely in a way. It's, there's a nice circularity to it. In that, first and foremost, Meow wasn't my idea. Meow was Simon Glenn's idea, and Simon's my business partner. <clears throat> so when when lockdown hit, um, my business vanished. My sales business vanished, gone. So I didn't work from the 11th of March through to mid July because everyone I worked with either legitimately couldn't justify having me in the business so i had two clients in the travel industry a client who worked entirely face to face with their customers um, and others and some that just panicked and wanted to focus on other stuff 
and some that I just couldn't understand why. Yeah, they still they were still going to have the big problems they had once lockdown was finished. And I'm like, no, 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 now's the time. And it's like, no, 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 no. So anyway, I did what came to, yeah, I, I reverted to type. I just started picking up the phone and chatting to people. Simon had the genius idea, and, and I still believe it is an absolute genius idea. And he set up a Zoom account and posted a thing called a Zoom a day and invited all his connections to come talk to him. And it just took off like a rocket. And he was booked up six weeks in advance. And so we were having a natter. I've known Simon for a couple of years. Um, and I, I said, well, I'm going to jump on one of these. And he went, well, actually, as luck would have it, I've got a cancellation for tomorrow. So I said, right, brilliant, count me in, I'm on. So I jumped on, and this is probably about two or three months into me uh, into Zoom a day. And um, so Simon's chatting away and, and sort of had begun to think about what a Zoom a day might look like going forward. So my ears pricked up at this because one thing I'm not particularly brilliant with is a blank piece of paper. But what I am very good at is taking an idea from there and either helping to commercialize it or expand upon where it is. So my ears pricked up at this. I'm thinking, this is a really good idea. I'm really enjoying this format. And actually, some of what he's saying is, is resonating with me. So I hung around at the end and said, have you got 10 minutes? And it's turned into three hours. Three hours turned into a commitment of investment between the two of us. I think we incorporated the business next week. We rebranded it the week after um, and then started off on the, the road that's taken us to here. So back in April, I think it was April, we set up Meow. We started off doing four hours a week, four meetings a week, because um, that's as much as Simon and I could do at the time. And it's just grown like a mushroom it's been mad and so now we're doing 37 hours a week we've got 19 um volunteer hosts who are amazing people who uh get what this is all about are real believers in the concept and just love the idea of actually being a part of it you know we don't pay them because we can't uh, and they're really helping us drive along. And so, you know, Simon and I make sure we look after them as much as we can. Um, and yeah, and then it got to the point where we thought, right, okay, we need to do something with this over and above what we've got. So we, back in May, we commissioned a developer to start looking at a bespoke platform for us to host Meow on. Because frankly, the platform we've got now is great, but it's a real Heath Robinson combo of, our website of Calendly and Zoom. And really, it's like a it's like an eggshell. You know, it's, it covers everything, but there's no depth to it. And when the new platform comes in, which won't be long now, probably be start of November, we'll soft launch. Um, it's infinite depth. So if you want to network at 10 o'clock on a Monday, that will never be closed to you. You will always be able to get the time that you want, whenever you want it, because the system will work out you know, if there's 10,000 people want to network at that time, it'll split you into two and a half thousand or person meetings. But you'll only ever know that you're in one meeting with one person. So there's never that anonymity, that feeling of being lost in a massive room. You're always very intimate, very human, connected with the people in the room with you. And that for me, is what we keep getting back about it. Is people like we've got a lady in Mid Wales. Um, who just comes on for the connection. She doesn't actually expect to win any business from it. She just loves it because she gets to talk to people properly and it sets her up for her day. And actually, to be fair, she's won a load of business out of it. That does um, helps businesses get into the supermarkets. And of course, everyone knows someone with a jam brand or imports wine or, you know, whatever. And she's picked up three or four real genuine prospects from it just from turning up for a natter. And that for me is it's what it's all about for me. It's the power of random. Turn up, show up, bring your authentic self, give a little bit, share a little bit. 
and it will come back. You know, it, the, the, the whole networking circle is proven. You, you show up and give and help and be present and all the rest of it, and it will come back to you. And, and that's being proved time and time and time again. You know, there's some really good connections being made, and, and I love it. And the amount of positive feedback I'm getting at the moment is it, it's, it's, it's awe-inspiring. I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by the reaction to it. We never thought it would go this fast. And it's just, it's phenomenal. But it's, the thing is, we both love it because it is the, the distillation of everything we, we really feel about networking. In that it's a human connection. It's a, it's a personal thing. It's something that needs to have time taken over it. Um, and I think we've, we've hit on a formula that works. And I'm, I'm just delighted. Absolutely delighted. You've, you've also uh, uh, made inroads across the pond. You're starting to go yeah. global. Uh, which you know, I, I guess the format that you've created is there's there's no, there's no reason why you wouldn't. It's universal, and that that's the great and that we we set the parameters for the platform up with exactly that in mind. We we always believed it could be a global thing, um, but we've you know let, let's be honest, we have a toehold in the American market at the moment. It's not you know we're not there you know, banging people's doors down. We have a host doing a couple of meetings now, but at the same time, and this is interesting, it's a slightly parallel piece of work we're doing with it, is we've got quite a few corporate inquiries about Meow at the moment. A couple of professional services firms in Leeds have reached out to us about how they can use it for clients and staff. And actually, we were talking to a global trade association in the States this week um about how they can use it to sort of revitalize the the interpersonal networking that goes on at trade shows that can't happen at the moment and so what we're talking to them about is a dedicated channel with their branding on that they can use to invite their industry to come and network under their banner it could be massively powerful and actually is a really really interesting uh, development for the for the service and it's always a truism isn't it when you put a service like that out to the market people will always use it in a way that you never expected and we're, we we love being led by our customers right can we do this and the answer is pretty much well yeah we can just do a bit of development work and we'll we'll, we'll put something together for you uh, you've you, you've partnered with um crowdcube and yes. you are in the middle of launching a, a crowd fund um what uh, th there's a few questions here um i'm interested in what's the future for meow what's the bigger picture and what's the what's the investment for and what you're hoping is going to come to fruition i'm also interested in why you've gone down the crowdfunding route and i'm also interested in your thoughts about crowdfunding uh and um and 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 uh you know what you must have massively learned uh, on a, on quite a steep learning curve over the last few weeks or months. So I'm not sure where you want to start. <laughs> we'll probably work backwards from that. So <laughs> we, both Simon and I, are as green as the grass when it comes to crowdfunding. I knew about it, and actually, it was it was one of the things. It was one of not that we're all like, hey, this is my idea. I floated it to Simon, and Simon knew even less about it than me, which wasn't a lot, you know, to be fair. Um, and so, because we were casting around for investment ideas, and the attitude of banks and VC houses at the moment is, or certainly from my perspective, is quite punitive towards businesses in a situation like we are. So we are, let, let, let's be brutal about it we've got a bloody good idea we've got some real traction but we are pre-money and unproven and our platform you know our ip uh, if you're looking at you know the brass tacks of an evaluation of a business like this the ip isn't there yet so it's a bit of a punt and let's be honest 19 out of 20 tech startups fail you know the, all the statistics are against you at this point but vcs are frankly um they're just, they're just, well, the ones I've spoken to, the vast majority of them are just taking the piss. 
Um, one guy got very offended when he asked for 73% of our business for the quarter of a million pounds that we're trying to raise. Got very offended when I laughed at him. And he went, well, that's the deal. And I went, that, that's fine, but I don't want it. You know, I didn't set a business up to be an employee. Um, so it, it becomes increasingly um, apparent to me that th this just wasn't the way to go. You know, tentative inquiries into the angel market was sort of similar. Angel investment is a little bit gentler, uh, but they still want their pound of flesh. And I can completely understand that. Absolutely fine. But it wasn't ever going to work for us. Um, because we'd have to give away too much to get the money that we needed. So we hit upon the idea of crowdfunding. And so had a look at it. And actually, to be fair, crowd, the reason we went with Crowdcube is because they made it really, really easy for us to inquire. And then I'll be honest, they jumped all over us and said, yeah, this is a brilliant idea. We think it had worked really well on the platform. Um, and then the question was, how much experience have you got? And we're like, none. And again, this is one of the things that, that helped us out massively. They put us in touch with a business called Overfund. Uh, and I say put us in touch. They said, you will use Overfund to help you or you won't raise. And I totally get why they did it. And yes, it's cost us a few quid, uh, but Overfund have been brilliant. We work with a guy called Jamie Harford. He's absolutely tremendous. Um, has guided us through every step of the way and made sure that we understand what each bit of the puzzle means and actually when there's been wrinkles in the road he's helped design those out and it's been really it's been a really pleasant experience it's been slightly longer than we expected i'll be honest we've been doing this now for nearly three months to get to the point where we're about to raise hopefully that should be coming this week next week um they've been really good overfunded been excellence and that whole support structure that crowdcube offered us um, has been great. And for, for virgin invest, you know, in virgin raisers like us, it's been, it's kept it exciting and interesting. And at the end of the day, you know, we're all doing this because it's fun. Um, and that's kept the interest levels up and kept us engaged and all the rest of it and sort of kept the fear at bay a little bit. And I'll be honest, we, we sent out a link on Facebook and on LinkedIn uh, about two weeks ago asking people to, pre-register for the fund um that gives us an idea of, of what our likely success is going to be and again i've been absolutely blown away i got a bit emotional actually when we got told the the number but we've had in excess of i think it's the last time we looked in excess of 55 grand pledged and that was about a week ago so it could be an awful lot more than that now uh, now i know that all won't come off i know that um, but we haven't even hit the platform yet. And we've got uh, over 50 grand's worth of investment uh, confirmed. So it just makes me, you know, I, I, I did have a little, uh, little wet when that it's, number came through. No, that's that's amazing. I've just put the uh, website on the screen for everyone, uh, meeow.co. Um, there's a link at the top of the website uh, if you're wanting to register your interest in the crowdfund um so uh that's probably the best best place to go and and of course that's where you can book a meow as well uh so um what uh, what um and and what's your message to uh investors potential investors what's uh what are you hoping uh what 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 are you hoping that they're going to get out of this well of course i guess it's <laughs> you tell me you tell me the thing is with, with a crowdfund if it's like <laughs> It's like investing in penny shares almost. If you invest with the in expectation of a return, then it is likely you will be disappointed. Um, however, and then this is the massive caveat that comes with it, because it is, it, they're all a punt, these. However, if you invest in a crowdfund, especially one like sort of first round raise that we're in, you get in at the cheapest possible point. So this stage of investment for any business is the most expensive money you'll ever borrow or the most expensive money you'll ever attract. We have to give away a chunk of our business to do this. So the great thing about Crowdcube is you actually own a piece of the business. So it's not like a Kickstarter where you buy a product in advance and you pay a bit more for it. You actually buy some stock. And if you buy enough stock, there's a place on the advisory board for you. 
You know, that's part of our reward structure. You know, you invest a certain amount of money, you can come quarterly and talk to us, and have ideas about the business, and we'll ask you, you know, it's a proper you know, advisory position. Um, so the potential for return is, is huge, but the odds are slightly iffy. However, if you've got a tax bill of a certain size, and you want to mitigate some of that and give yourself a chance to make more money, which is where a lot of these investors are. There's a scheme called SEIS, which is uh, Seed Corn or Small Enterprise Investment Scheme, and EIS, which is Enterprise Investment Scheme, where you get a portion of your investment back as tax relief. So SEIS is amazing. It's 50%. And the first 150000 of our investments is likely to be covered under SEIS. And then there's an eight, uh, hundred thousand pounds worth of EIS that's again subject to pre-assurance, but we're hopeful it'll be there. Um, which means it's like free bets at Paddy Power. You know, you've got to stay in for three years. There's some there's some terms and conditions. But if you've got a tax bill and you want to have a punt and you want to get involved in something fresh and interesting and whatever else, um, then it's a great way to go about it. And you can invest for twenty five quid, I think, is the 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 share price for a single share. I think I think it's a, a great investment. I mean, you know, it's just when you when you get a feeling like you were talking about earlier, um, there's a huge opportunity here and there's a huge gap in the market for the product or service, uh, both really, that you're providing. So, I, I, yeah, I think I think get in early and, and there's a great opportunity. Uh, what would your no, message be? For Johnny. <laughs> I've, I've, already, I've already registered an interest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I um, <laughs> um, I was going to ask you about what your what your thoughts on crowdfunding. You know, if, if I was to consider crowdfunding, what would be the things that I should be thinking about? Thing is, there's 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 a, a real what go and have a look at Crowdcube is the first thing I would say, or go and have a look at there's another one called Cedars. Um, they're slightly different, but actually they've just this week merging. So that's you know it's good news for people like us. Good news for people who are looking to fund in future because it's a much bigger market that's going to be brought 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 to bear. Um, but go and have a look because this month on Crowdcube, you've had a um, a mixture of everything from uh, brand new fintech through to um, electric cars through to uh, Irish whiskey distillery. You know, there's 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 everything on there. Of all sorts of different things, and there are opportunities to have some fairly outlandish bets on some really, really niche stuff. That if it comes off, it'll make you a fortune. You know, but one might argue that the odds are slightly longer on investments like that working. Um, but there's a bit of something for everyone, and all I would say to anyone that's thinking of applying, and actually one of you know, there's there's a, there's a business I've been involved with recently that have have approached <coughs> Crowdcube with some success and hopefully we'll do that going forward, is, is go and talk to them about it. At the end of the day, they make their money through helping you raise. But the great thing about what I like about Crowdcube is they won't let anyone in. You've got to justify why you think it's good. They've got to, they've got to see that, that your idea has merit, particularly in our case because we're pre-money. You've got to see that your idea has merit. You've got to see that there is a market there for it. You know, you've got to justify that, back that up. Um, the process is quite rigorous you know you've got you've got to you've got to uh sort of uh, justify your place at the table but i would say that anybody that's got a business that needs to scale quickly and you don't like the idea of going to a vc or the, the terms of their investment is is stuff that's, that's, that's unpalatable give it a lash you know it's it's a it's a relatively um easy in terms of the um, uh, the investment relationship between you and your investors uh, it's quite straightforward um and you know it, it, it's just a different way really. it depends on what what works for you at the end of the day i can't sit here and recommend either way all i can say is we've had a good experience and and it's been uh, and hopefully it's going to be really successful when it does go live so uh, and i think there's some great things coming from me out from some of the 
uh, things I've been hearing bubbling away with regard to some of the ideas you've got and how you're going to uh, structure to make sure the right people are in the right rooms and 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 everyone gets what they want out of it. Uh, from what I from what I can understand, there's some really clever ideas being put into it as well. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. To that. I'm not I'm not sure how much is public or how much is. Yeah, yeah. Um, our develop. I'll be honest with you. Our developers are absolutely amazing. Uh, and thanks very much to you know to Phil Story at Glow for recommending them. These are the same guys that made Glow, a business called Decimal Cloud over in Bolton. They're just tremendous, innovative, sensible. You know, very commercial. They've been brilliant with us. Um, and actually, what they've put together is an extremely clever platform with some fabulous commercials behind it in terms of cost of use and all the rest of it. So actually the IP itself is really valuable, I think, um, particularly as we move into this sort of video age. Um, and yeah, as far as and the thing is, we're set up, and it's, this, is, this is a point really worth stressing. We are set up for no other purpose than to make the experience of networking as good as possible. And that's it. We're not set up to drive loads of business. We're not set up to increase your referral rate. That, that'll that just happen. And it's been proven to just happen as a result of you turning up and bringing your best self. Um, what we are set up to do is to make the experience of networking as close and some may argue maybe slightly better than being in in-person networking so you don't have to get in the car you don't have to drink warm wine you don't have to eat curly sandwiches and you don't have to put up with the idiot that wants to sell you you know business cards made of cheese um what you what you do is you put yourself in a room with three other people who hopefully will have something in common with you and have a chat to them for an hour and do that as many times as you want for what we honestly believe a really reasonable cost which actually doesn't even apply now so it's free to use now to so get on another day. And, and, and if you did have to carry around business cards made of cheese what cheese would it be oh now there's a good question um business cards made of cheese i think i i am a big fan and this comes back to me being a poncy chef um i'm a big fan of a pyrenean sheep's cheese called osso irati which if you can get some go check it out nice so it sounds it sounds very nice indeed. Um, this has been absolutely enjoyable and delightful, um, and uh, uh, we, we've come to the end, I'm afraid. Um, but it's it, <laughs> it's been really good. Um, if you've been watching, thank you so much for watching. Uh, yes, thank and you. Please join us uh, in the uh, in the group. Um, please comment. Let us know what you thought. And if you were listening, uh, thank you for listening. And please subscribe. Um, Chris, it's been delightful. You're you're saying that we just need to watch out because it's it's imminent. The crowdfund going live. Yeah. If you if you if you're listening to this and you, and you think yes and you know I've got a spare X amount of quids kicking around that you want to invest, drop me an email. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I will accept connection requests from anybody. Um. And I'll send you a link to pre-register and that will inform you the second the raise goes live. And then, you know, SEIS is first come, first served. That's all I have to say. And if we've got a product or service that we're looking to sell more of and we're struggling with a, a sales team that aren't really uh, delivering right now, um, where do we find you online? Just come, come get me on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, that's where I do all my business stuff. Uh, so either go to my business page, which is Carrot, and yes, if you have a name like mine, you really have to work it as hard as you can, uh, or just connect with me on LinkedIn and ask me what you want to do. I will uh, do the best I can to help. Brilliant. Uh, thanks so much again, Chris, and uh, we'll see you or uh, speak to you all soon. Take care. Perfect. Okay.